Hello? Yes, <laughs> you can hear me now. Uh, I would like to pay your attention because we would like to start the discussion in the second panel. Uh, so good afternoon, my name is Aleksandra kuznicka holeva I am legal counsel in CMS and former member of the European Commission Expert Group on Standard Essential Patents. And I have a pleasure to chair today's second panel, uh, which has been planned for today, on what do the four pillars uh, of the proposal regulation achieve and where and if there is a scope for improvement. Uh, we are honored to have five esteemed speakers today. And I will must, uh, allow myself to start with the female representatives. So we have Simona Poppa. Simona is a senior director in InterDigital, responsible for government relations. Rebecca Porat. Uh, Rebecca is global IP policy director for Intel Corporation. She leads a team on IP policy and standards in Intel global government affairs organizations. We have Judge Fabian Hoffman. Uh, who since 2010 is a judge of Federal Court of Justice of Germany, and he has been a member of the European Commission Expert Group on Standard Essential Patents. Then we have Enrico Bonadio. Enrico is a reader in intellectual property law at City University of London. And finally, last but not least, we have Peter uh, Kameseska, a Brussels-based private practitioner versed in EU law. Uh, Peter adds a regulatory angle to this panel with close of 30 years of uh, balancing the crossover between IP and antitrust. So welcome, and uh, I would like to briefly uh, introduce you to the aim of, of this second panel. So uh, in this discussion, based on the very wording of the draft regulation that we have now on the table and which will be subject to vote in the European Parliament next week, if objectives of the regulation are met and uh, where there is a scope for improvement. And I would like to start uh, with the first aspect, which is the scope of application of the regulation, because uh, I think it is crucial to organize the debate, which we can hear now in the public space. So Peter, I will start to, uh, with you, and I would like to ask you, how do you understand uh, current scope of application of the regulation? Uh, thank you, Alexandra. So, um, upfront disclosures. Um, one is I do this in my personal capacity. The other, you kindly already um, uh, did for me, Alexandra. I'm a regulatory lawyer, and of course, us regulatory lawyer types always do what the regulator tells us. So, I'm afraid this will be the boring part of today's conference, um, as anticipated by Camille in his actually quite wonderful introductory setting, because I've made speak notes. So, speak notes on scope. A uh, scope you find in uh, the current Article 1.2 of the draft regulation and uh, through three parameters. The regulation, if you read that article, shall apply to, one, all patents in force in the EU, two, that are claimed to be essential, and three, after the entry into force of the regulation. So, if you take a minute and you read that again, does that mean that the regulation covers patents, any patents in force or standards in force that are claimed to be essential from early on 2025? Because, you know, Article 72.1 would tell us that two, uh, 20 days after OJ publication, somewhere early in 2025, uh, this beast um, would enter into force if we vote in that direction and the process stays on track. Well, um, is that it on scope? It will apply to everything? Not quite. So we're not yet heading to drinks and to the other topics for our panel. Because first of all, as with any general rule, of course, there are two exceptions built in. Uh, you find those in Articles 1, 3, and 4. One is if there's sufficient evidence that implementation works fine, well, then the Commission can set aside the application uh, of the, uh, at least the, the, the friend determination and the aggregate royalty through a delegated act. Or if there's sufficient uh, evidence that pre-entry into force patents uh, implementation would not work fine, would work fine, then uh, through, again, delegated acts, uh, the Commission uh, can still make the regulation apply. So is that then all clear on scope? Unfortunately, still the answer is no, because the question is, of course, what would be sufficient evidence for the Commission to decide whether or not the implementation of um, the licensing market is either working well or is you know, severely distorted. 
in fact, the question then would become, what is a severe distortion? And us competition types uh, will get very excited about that. Maybe the regulation ha, actually would tell us. Um, it's nice to be on a, a panel with some fellow Germans, so I could use the word Jein, uh, which is a German way of saying, well, it probably depends in some form or fashion. Um, the commission in its draft has taken a first cut. That's the vaunted recital four, which is a, or, or initially was a fairly plain vanilla interpretation um, of what would be uh, covered in terms of scope. Uh, when that became known, there was some intense lobbying, and suddenly uh, in the plain vanilla text of what is or isn't covered, wireless uh, telecommunication uh, was taken out. That then caused an outcry. Uh, Yuri has now uh, removed the reference to wireless standard, and recital four is back to plain vanilla. Um, well, so is there anything more in the regulation? Yuri has taken a step by in inserting a new recital 4, which is then called 4A, and that provides some coloring as to uh, material impediments, what that could be, or, uh, you know, whether those would require a delegated act. It identifies other uh, items such as uh, unreasonable delays or excessive costs or multiple legal disputes uh, as indicator that something may be uh, amiss. Um, as you know, regulatory types go, we are very hopeful that uh, if this would become adopted, the Commission will then issue guidelines which will tell us exactly what these grand terms are all about. Uh, because there's other open-ended questions, and this is where I think I'll be handing it to my fellow panelists. Um, Article 1-2 references essentiality claims. Well, what does that mean? Is that earlier than a declaration? Does that even matter? Um, that there is a, maybe a difference with the STO processes we come to love and, and, and like so much. Yuri also um, makes explicit reference to a couple of elephants in the scope room. Uh, so there's mentioning to supply chain um, and license to all as a good topic for the commission to do a bit more work on, maybe in those guidelines. There's also a reference to uh, patent pools, um, some of which may be joint, just a joint licensing arrangement, as we just heard, um, that might require some guidance as well from the Commission, as according to the URI draft. Uh, maybe the tech transfer block exemption, remember that other parallel uh, process that's ongoing in Brussels world, which deals with patent pools, uh, might give us some additional guidance, but it will interface in some form or fashion with our guide, uh, with our regulation here. And so finally, uh, what would we do with, well, those new post-entry into four standards that are based on patents, which are actually old patents from prior generations, for example. All these are good questions to wonder uh, whether it's in the scope or not of the regulation, whether it's something that requires a delegated act in one form or another. But maybe, Simona, you can take us into that. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Is this working? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I'll have to disappoint the audience. I'm not going to answer all these questions, Peter. Um, I have my own notes. Um, very happy to be here with all of you today. Um, I'll maybe um, make just a few comments on the, the question from the, the previous panel on, on innovation. Um, and I'll be very brief, but it ties in actually with, with my own notes. Um, I would say that innovation is not a self-fulfilling prophecy. Just because we say we want to be innovators, um, it doesn't make us innovators. It, it's, 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 a, it's a big recipe, and, and, and um, there, you need a lot of stars to be aligned in order for an innovation actually to happen. My own company, you know, we've been around for over 50 years, um, and we've, we, we're, we're contributors to um, a number of, of, of standards and, and continue to innovate. And I can tell you that it's a long way between an idea and when actually that idea becomes something tangible, that it hits the market. And, and in our experience, it can take all, almost 10 years. So it's a long, a very, very long way. And then what do you need in this, in, this, in this path? You need, again, a lot of things to align, and a good regulatory framework is one of them. Now, of course, the question of the panel, of the previous panel was, you know, does this regulation actually help innovation? And my short answer will be no, <laughs> not necessarily. And um, I don't think that generally that we can regulate our way into innovation. I think there are other things that we need to, to again, put together in order to have um, a successful competitive market. And I'll leave it at that. Um, coming back to the, 
the question uh, from Alexandra to the scope. Um, you mentioned Peter delegated acts, and, and I'm going to sort of point out a few um, details which kind of, again, are, are, are more questions than, than answers, actually. Um, I'm not going to sit here and tell you everything is perfect. We don't need um, any regulatory intervention ever. There is a reason why the Commission, European Commission exists, and I think they'll continue to exist. But this regulation just has too many convoluted and unclear areas that need to be um, clarified and ironed out before we can say that it's actually going to help um, anyone. So, you know, coming to delegated acts, um, we all know the definition of delegated acts, which is supposed to supplement non-essential elements of a, of a legislation. Well, the scope is pretty essential to me. So is the delegated act the right way to amend the scope? And how many times are we going to be allowed to amend the scope? Um, it's, it's very unclear. It's in, in, in my own experience, um, I haven't seen this before. I've, I've been around for 20 years dealing with legislation in various areas. But amending the scope an limited number of times whenever a standard is proven to um, um, be problematic or not, it's quite a daunting task. Um, Camille also touched on, on, on sort of the better regulations and, and it was a quick brush, but I'd like to pause there for a second because again, the studies that were commissioned by the Commission, by the European Commission, and even the impact assessment, we see in a few places that um, there is inconclusive evidence that we need such a heavy regulatory intervention. And again, I repeat, I'm not saying everything is perfect, but I'm, we're talking about a very heavy-handed piece of regulation here. Um, and then also tying in with the issue of, of, of innovation, and somebody said it on the previous panel, well, I wouldn't be worried about the effect of innovation. Well, being on the sort of short end of the stick on this, um, I would, I'm, I'm, I'm worried for my own company, because looking at the impact assessment, um, the uh, net benefit for implementers, and I'm quoting, I, I didn't make up these numbers, <laughs> the net benefit for implementers is plus 24.4 million. The net cost for SCP holders is um, 20, minus 28.9 million. So we are at the short end of the stick here. Um, the inclusion of the existing standards, again, I'm not sure that, you know, it's, it's again, the looking at the evidence um, at, and, and how the market functions. Is there enough evidence to say, you know, very clearly that we need to include existing standards? Do we see specific products or markets that haven't been addressed here? Um, and I'm not sure that's, that's the case. Um, and finally, um, you know, looking at the jury, uh, um, jury uh, report, I think there's a lot of confusion in, in some of the amendments on how the market works, and I'll give one example related to scope. Um, they give us a month um, from the publication of a standard to notify the standard to the UIPO, um, or no, to the Commission actually, uh, in case the standard doesn't pose a problem. Well, it takes years for, for, for a market to actually stabilize and to see if there are problems or not. So I wonder what exactly can we observe in that one month? It's, it's very unclear to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Simona. Uh, also, still uh, being in the subject of the scope of application of this regulation, I wanted to touch upon uh, one aspect which came out with the recent uh, amendments proposed by jury, namely that uh, under those amendments, if I understand them correctly, also patents which are not subject to front commitment are uh, within the scope of application of this regulation. And uh, Rebecca, what's, uh, what's your take on that? Thank you. Now we're getting to the nitty-gritty, and I also have speaking notes. Um, before answering, please allow me to note that the views that I will be sharing today throughout this conference are my personal views and do not necessarily reflect positions of my employer. Thank you. Um, I believe that the expansion to SEPs for which no frank commitment has been given is unhelpful. The regulation is all about fostering the conclusion of licenses on frank terms. But this amendment would also capture situations where no friend license offering is due. Where the SEP holder has made a friend commitment, it is legitimate to expect that he will offer friend licenses. And where a standard is so widely adopted that the SEP holder holds a dominant position in the market, he may have to offer such licenses under competition law. But in all other situations, I would see no justifiable reason to expect a SEP holder to even offer a license at all. 
I will leave it to my learned co-panelists to further comment on this from a legal perspective, but let me just illustrate it from, you know, industry perspective, industry experience. Patents can become SEPs without the patent holders doing. Imagine a company that owns a patent that is vital to differentiating its own business. The company, therefore, does not wish to give a license to anybody else. Now imagine an SDO, a Standards Development Organization, that has developed a standard that includes that company's patented technology, thus turning the patent into a SEP. Let's say the patent holder is not a member of the SDO and only learns about that development as some initial implementations start appearing on the market. Given the importance of the patent to protect his own business, the company, of course, wants to quickly stop that third-party infringement and wants to stop the standard from grabbing hold in the market and giving, putting him into the position of being in a dominant position. Why on earth should that patent holder be obliged to go through the loop of first registering the patent, of initiating a conciliation procedure that is all about terms of a license that he's not prepared to offer in the first place? This is not a purely theoretical example. You have to remember that there are thousands of new standards developed by hundreds of SDOs every single year. That Thank would you. be my comment. Thank you, Rebecca, for that. And uh, Fabian, also from the litigation perspective and uh, taking into consideration your experience as a judge, how do you understand this current scope of application of the regulation? Yeah, it's a very interesting question, but first, of course, I have to also do some remarks up front. Of course, I speak in my own capacity, not as a representative of my court. And also, um, I'm not able to answer to all the criticism that has been on the uh, uh, pr uh, pr uh, panel before against uh, the German court's decisions. Uh, I was even inclined to say the bashing of these judgments. but. Um, but let me say maybe the one thing to that, uh, that these judgments have driven a statistic that might have reached a self-fulfilling prophecy right now that goes beyond what is the law in these judgments. Um, and maybe maybe uh, the, the, the regulation is some way out of this. I would hope so. Uh, but... Uh, it is. It is not easy. Uh, it, it is. You have to do. Maybe you have to do, uh, 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 separate the statistics from what is in the judgments, actually. And um, and one other general remark I would really like to make is that you always keep in mind what 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 are SEPs and all the the friend determination good for. It is good for to receive uh, to, to to gain a better technology in standards. And that is, and the the mechanism is that you have inventors that just make the invention without um, having to sell the products that uses the invention, and by having the patents and the friend obligation, you have a system where the uh, investment in the invention uh, um, can be uh, can, can find its revenue, and that's why we're doing that, and. I'm saying this because the solution to all these problems is not to just decrease the revenue of the invent, uh, inventors, to just say, well, they should pay less. I think what we should aim for is that the level playing field is, uh, will be better. And not to say, well, just pay less to the uh, SEP holders um, and, and, then, and then everybody will be fine. And I don't think that that's the 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 aim of uh, uh, the regulation either. But coming back to your pr to to your to 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 your question, first of all, I don't think that the question whether you have made a commitment for France is uh, is relevant because that's not the uh, the issue for all the problems. That's not the reason for all the problems we have. The reason for all the problems that we have is that um, is that we. Uh, uh, that there is somebody who has a patent and he has an obligation to license for on friend terms. And on the other side, we have an implementer who needs the technology in the patent. So we have what economists say, uh, a locked-in market 
we do not have the situation where either side could say, well, I don't want a license, I don't want to take a license, which is a very uh, core basis if, if you want to have a free market, that, every, that each party can say, well, I don't agree, and that's it. That's what we do not have if in, 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 in standard, with standard essential patents. And the, the major question, of course, is, um, uh, and, and, and therefore it is not necessary uh, to whether the party has, or the, the SAP holder has made a friend commitment. In the uh, Orange Book case, like Christopher, Christopher already uh, told, uh, uh, told us, um, there was no uh, um, uh, friend commitment at all. And it was necessary to oblige the SAP holder to, uh, to, to, um, uh, uh, to, to provide a license because the, 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 the market was in this situation. And now what uh, Rebecca Ted told us is, of course, a different situation that if, if somebody has a, a normal patent, a non-SEP patent, and somebody else builds a standard around it. Um, if you have a situation like this, it's a, a question of the substantive law, whether there is a friend obligation or not. And uh, this will have to be decided by, by, by the courts uh, that decide on this uh, substantive law. It might depend how the market evolves. It might, uh, it, it might be the case that if the standard that has been created is so successful that the first patent holder must accept his obligation uh, to license. But that's not a question that uh, the regulation is uh, uh, dealing about. The regulation actually says uh, if somebody claims a patent to be, to be essential, which I think is not such a good uh, uh, wording, uh, because what happens if the SAP holder says, well, I'm not claiming it to be essential, but it is essential. And, and, and it is essential, although, uh, and I, I, I committed a friend commitment and all this, but I don't claim it. That's, that's a, a problem with, uh, with the regulation. Um, yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Fabian, Fabian for those comments. Uh, we got really into details uh, on that topic, but now I would like to move on to the next part of the regulation. That, in fact, includes a restriction on the ability to enforce SEPs, uh, namely bring a claim for infringement in relation to implementation of the standard that has not been registered in the newly created register within the prescribed uh, time limit. And the second restriction that is also uh, uh, often commented uh, in that respect is the uh, requirement to conduct conciliation in the form of front determination process prior to enforcing individual uh, SEPs. It is crucial part of the regulation as it is uh, heavily discussed uh, nowadays whether such restrictions are in fact in line with the fundamental rights uh, recognized in the relevant articles of the Charter of Fundamental Rights and in the international obligations contained in TRIPS agreement. Uh, the Commission itself uh, touched upon this topic in the very draft proposal uh, and the uh, uh, Commission referred to the uh, uh, case law of the European Court of Justice indicating that uh, in its opinion uh, in fact the, uh, the relevant restrictions are in line with the uh, European law and uh, with the relevant uh, international obligations. But again, we, ha we hear now uh, different opinions uh, on that topic coming both from academics and from uh, UPC judges. So that's why I would like to discuss this topic now and I turn to you, Enrico. Can you provide us uh, your views uh, on this topic from the academic perspective? Thanks, thanks, Alexander. And yes, there have been some criticism about the alleged violation of uh, fundamental rights by some provisions of this regulation, especially, you know, the delay in enforcing the patent. So some bureaucratic steps, as we know, are, uh, are envisaged, uh, which should prevent patent owners from uh, enforcing their, their rights, you know, before these, these, these bureaucratic steps are, are finalized. Uh, it is true, of course, we know that IP is a fundamental right, right? Article 17 of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights is clear, Article 17, Paragraph two, there is also uh, uh, Article one, Protocol one of the European Convention on Human Rights protecting uh, uh, 
property, including uh, intangible property. So IP is a fundamental right. That's, there is no doubt about that. But this is not the end of the story. Uh, there are limits. Of course, fundamental rights are subject to, to limits. Such protection is not absolute. Uh, the very same provision, Article 17 of the EU Charter, reminds us that the use of property may be regulated by law insofar as necessary for the general interest. Similar, uh, similar limitations are to be found in, in, the, in Article 1, Protocol 1 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Many constitutions around the world also provide limitations to fundamental rights. And in my opinion, what the proposed SEP regulation does uh, 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 is exactly that, providing some safeguards aimed at making a, a SEP licensing ecosystem more transparent and fair in the, in the interest of competition and finally consumer's welfare, right? Again, IP is not an absolute right. Of course, it's important. We need to protect inventions and new technologies, but introducing limits to IP protection to address the imbalances and the inefficiencies that we, we know are existing in this market in my opinion, does not amount to totally denying such protection. It just, in my opinion, implies redirecting IP towards satisfying, satisfying, satisfying also important public interest. As has been noted by a colleague of mine, Martin Uzevich, I think this, this quote is very important. Article 17, paragraph two, protects rights, but not the system. It is not an immunity from legislative change. And I just want also to look outside this area because limiting IP rights is not just, it does not just happen in this area. Think of uh, pat pharmaceutical patents and access to medicines. Think of brands and trademarks. Uh, whoever smokes in this room knows how packs, cigarette packs are uh, marketed nowadays. Now this is the standardized packaging. There has been litigations around the world that the WTO um, in Australia, in UK, at the EU, tobacco brands have fought quite strongly against that measure. They lost everywhere. And they lost this argument, the fundamental right argument, right? So it is not just uh, an issue which is in our area, no, in IT, Internet of Things. IP is important, is indispensable, but may be subject to limits. And what about the other fundamental right at issue here? The right of access to courts, Article 47 of the Charter. It has been noted that, that uh, you know, SEP owners would be prevented from starting legislation for a nine month period, uh, and these would constitute a serious interference with the enforcement rights and a gross interference with justice. Again, I think this is not totally accurate because again, this right of access to courts is not absolute either. And may be subject to limit in specific circumstances, especially as long as the uh, restrictive measure does not impair totally the essence of the right and is proportionate to the aim. I want to draw your attention to a case of the court decided by the Court of Justice, Rosalba Alassini versus Telecom Italia Spa where uh, the Court of Justice uh, you know, focused on a compulsory condition for parties to have to attempt to settle dispute, disputes related to universal service and users' rights con relating to electronic communications, through out-of-court mechanisms before approaching a national court. So there was a compulsory step there as well. And the court held that the aims of such a measure the aims were legitimate and not disproportionate to the aims. So we have already a, legislative, a judicial intervention by the Court of Justice on uh, you know, some uh, conditions, some, some, some limits to the, 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 the rights to access courts. And of course, a similar line of reasoning was broadly used by the Court of Justice in the YA case in July 2015, because we know that you know, that, that ruling has limited, you know, the, the exclusive right of SEP owners, no? 
while the irrevocable uh, commitment to grant license on front terms, you know, cannot, of course, deny patent rights, it nevertheless justifies the imposition on patent owners of an obligation to, to comply with specific requirements, right, when going to course. Uh, then just a few, a couple of comments on TRIPS agreement. No? We know Article 27 of the TRIPS agreement says that uh, 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 patent rights should be available and enjoyable uh, 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 without discrimination as to the field of technology, right? Some commentator, I read somewhere that uh, the, 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 the proposal, the, the SEP proposal would uh, violate this principle because it would you know, introduce limits in a specific sector. But this is not, again, entirely accurate because in a WTO decision, the WTO panel in the pharmace Canada Pharmaceutical Patent Decision said that, okay, discrimination is prohibited under Article 27 TRIPS, but still there are possibilities, chances for states to differentiate, you know, and to introduce some specific limits in specific areas. In that case was access to medicines, but, you know, uh, which is very sensitive, but you know there might be other areas such as you know standardized technology where limits are required. And then Article 41 trips on enforcement. Right? It says that uh, countries should ensure that enforcement procedures are available under their law to permit action. Blah 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 blah. But that very same provision also tells us that in the in the second part that. These enforcement procedures should be applied in a manner to avoid the creation of barriers to legitimate trade and to provide for safeguards against their abuse. So it's a balanced provision which might be invoked also in our case to justify some limits. Just to, to conclude, I mean, uh, with, with a general comment, uh, uh, yes, I mean, in my opinion, as, as I said, this new regime seems to be balanced. I mean, it is not totally denying the rights of, of patent owners, as, 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 it, as it is fair, of course, because patent owners invest lots of money uh, in technologies, in developing technology. But I think there is a, a, a quite misconception with the broader debate about SEPs. And the conventional wisdom is that just patent owners, of, owner of patents over standards are true innovators. Well, implementers can also be innovators too, especially small and medium-sized enterprises which come up with ideas to the market. So implementers which seek licenses from patent owners are also innovators sometimes because they use standards, often use standards as building blocks for developing new products, which may end up being protected by other patents down, you know, down, downstream, right? So, and I conclude with this, sorry for being for a bit long. By introducing, in my opinion, by introducing some proportionate limits to enforcement rights of patent, of patent owners, I think the proposed regulation not only aims at making the system fairer, more transparent, blah, 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 but it, it might even offer patent owners more opportunities to reach, opportunities to reach the market by giving uh, you know, access giving them access to a broader pool of standard users and downstream innovators. That's my, that's my final, you know, final conclusion. Thank you, Enrico, for that. And in particular, this last point is worth noting in the uh, fact of uh, the very wording of the regulation that also impose on implementers some restrictions with respect to uh, access to, to court. And now uh, I would like to turn to Fabian. Fabian, uh, how do you read those restrictions in the light of jurisprudence now so far? And uh, in particular, can, uh, can you also provide us with your views on how this obligatory but non-binding front determination procedure can be used in litigation? Um, okay. Uh, let me, let me start with, with the fundamental rights. I think what uh, Enrico said is, um, I agree with that uh, completely. And I just want to make some examples uh, uh, for, for such kind of uh, situations. Well, we have in Germany, we have in the, uh, the, the uh, European um, uh, patent um, uh, um, uh, agreement, um, uh, uh, we, we have 
the, the procedure that you have to file first an opposition in the office before you get to the, the boards of appeal. And in Germany, that is necessary before you can file a validity suit. So the fundamental rights do not uh, give the right to, to say you, do have, you, you must have only two instances or three instances, <coughs> and you, you must be able to immediately go to court. And uh, I see that also in the ECJ judgment, uh, Alassini and, and uh, Menini. Um, and especially that, 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 that goes along with uh, 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 intellectual property. In, in Germany, we have um, uh, um, a rule that if um, collective management organizations uh, claim um, uh, revenues, uh, 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 claim remunerations for uh, using the uh, copyright uh, of others, um, they must first go to uh, a, a conciliator at the uh, patent office and uh, um, they gave a non-binding uh, proposal uh, like it is uh, done in the, in the regulation. Uh, and uh, nobody, really nobody has ever thought that this uh, provision that you have first go to the patent office and the conciliator in the patent could uh, uh, violate any fundamental rights. Neither the right to go to court, neither uh, the uh, uh, right for um, uh, of intellectual uh, property, and of course it would be a violation of fundamental right if the fan determination, de determination would just be a waste of time. But um, I will come up to this. I don't think that it's a waste of time. It's very useful in in, in many uh, 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 in many uh, uh, um, uh, aspects. Uh, but let me take, uh, say something uh, to, to TRIPS again, uh, um, th especially the fact that you cannot, um, uh, at least I read it, uh, the regulation in that way, that you cannot uh, claim uh, past uh, damages um, uh, for a time that you have not registered uh, uh, the uh, SEP. Um, uh, this is, of course, time for, for these uh, time slots, that is definite. So you, you really lose uh, uh, your claim. Uh, but I think uh, this is uh, proportionate as well because, um, uh, first of all, in patents, it's absolutely normal that you first have to register the patent um, before you can claim anything. And this is just a second registration uh, to say, well, this is a standard essential patent, that's my name, and uh, the patent reads on that section uh, of the standard. And you really need this transparency because not as in with non-SAPs, um, with non-SAPs you, you, you ask uh, the, an implementer to make a free, uh, uh, research on freedom to operate. And that's why he has to pay damages if he doesn't, if, if he didn't do that, or he, he didn't read the patents right. But have you ever tried a freedom to operate for for a standard essential product like uh, a mobile phone? Uh, I, I've heard some, I've read some articles that said that's just impossible because there's not enough lawyers in the world to do that. And um, and then you take a look at Trips Article 44 that says uh, exactly actually that um, uh, the, uh, the courts shall have the authority uh, to uh, uh, order to pay damages uh, because the infringer knowingly or with reasonable grounds to know engaged in infringement activity. And this is normally with non-SCPs, that's not a problem. And the, 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 the rule is made actually for non-SCPs. Um, but if, if you ask an implementer who, who sells uh, a fair font, for instance, um, does he know about all the patents uh, that, that, that he's using? Probably not. And the question, of course, again is, does he uh, have reasonable, reasonable grounds to know? And here comes the regulation. The regulation says, if a patent is registered, register in the way that it says my pattern reads on that section of the standard, then the implementer has, reason, uh, has a reasonable ground to know that he is really violating 
uh, uh, infringing uh, that patent. And if you do not have this uh, uh, registration, then I, then I read the regulation in the way, well, then the implementer does not have reasonable grounds to, to know. And the only question is whether TRIP says that the, uh, uh, that the legislator is uh, uh, allowed to, to make such a rule or whether uh, the court is the only uh, instance that would be allowed to, uh, to, to rule on that. But I think TRIPS is not uh, an, an uh, agreement uh, that is dealing about uh, um, uh, the, the powers in, in the state or in a European Union who has the powers to, to, to rule on what. Uh, so I think it's, in my view, it's, it's normal that a legislator can say how uh, the courts shall deal uh, with this uh, uh, problem. Uh, yeah. And, and well, and then, I, well, well, then you ask me about what, what the friendly judgment termination uh, uh, is about to, to bring for, a legisla uh, uh, to, to, for a litigation. Um, for litigation, the, 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 many, uh, the big advantage is, is that you have uh, a reasoned proposal, a proposal by an expert that does this in a way uh, like you could have done that with a, as an expert witness in court. So you start with an, uh, with an expert opinion. Um, uh, when, when you start your, the litigation, you already have an expert opinion um, on what uh, uh, the friend uh, uh, rate and the firm terms could or should be. And this is, of course, not binding. And that's, it must be not binding, because otherwise you couldn't be obliged to... Uh, 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 to to to, uh, to do th uh, this franchise termination before, but um, if you if the if you start a litigation with such a uh, reasoned proposal, which serves as an expert opinion, then this structures the litigation uh, extremely, because either everything is okay, then the court, uh, it, uh, the, the, everything is right, that uh, is uh, said in the expert in, 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 the, in the proposal, in the reasoned proposal, then the court can just say, well, that's okay, and um, uh, I, I uh, render my judgment, I, I issue my judgment just in the way the proposal has been. And as I said, in Germany we have um, uh, the uh, uh, such, uh, 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 such a conciliation process in the copyright law, and that's exactly what uh, the Bundesgerichtshof has said, that what the conciliator proposes uh, is presu presumed to be the right determination, and, they, uh, and the courts just take a look whether it is this really the right determination uh, uh, on what should be, uh, uh, sh should should be paid. And um, then, um, but let me tell me also some, some other advantages of uh, the friend determination. One f very big advantage is you don't have to do it as a, last, uh, as a last step. It doesn't have to be the last step before you go to court. If you, if you see that your party is not really willing to negotiate, you don't have to wait three or four years to find out and go to court. You can do that after one year, after really recognize this is not going well. And, and the point is, if the negotiations between two parties do, are not, in a, are not uh, made in a constructive way, it's good to have a third person. And, and to good to have a third person that is independent, and a third person, not like, the, uh, like Uta Schneider, who, who is an intermediary, but she has to reach an agree still has to reach an agreement between the two parties. The conciliator does not have to reach an agreement, uh, or dozens of parties. <laughs> the conciliator does not have to, to, to reach an agreement because he can, makes, uh, can make a proposal uh, on his own. And that speeds up the communication process a lot, I think. And therefore, it is, it is uh, a, a good option for, for the parties to say, well, I, I think it's not good when if we uh, start on negotiating just the two of us, let's get a third person that is independent and helps us uh, to, to find a good solution for our problem. And then the th third point. 
here because yeah, I know yeah. that Peter uh, that. Uh, is out of time and he have, uh, will have to leave us uh, before the end of panel. So I wanted to give Peter a uh, voice now and ask you to comment on that last point, in fact, on front determination and how, in your view, it can be used uh, as an input in the courts. I can do this very quickly and not as eloquently as Fabian, but it's the same point. You get a third party to say something on friend determination. So it's not the view of one or the other with whatever interest behind it. It's, I think, in, in German, we'd call it probably an indizien beweis. So it's an indicative you know, piece of evidence which a court can or cannot take on board. But at least there is, if it's done well by experts, which are supposed to know their stuff, it will give us their view, and that might help the court, and then we're back to, does it speed up? Is those nine months, as per what Enrico was saying, actually much quicker than what you'd get after three, four, five, or even six years? Simona, now we'll turn to you. <laughs> can, you can you please uh, tell us what's your views on this nine month, in fact, uh, injunction bar and uh, registration requirements? Uh, from the perspective of patent holders negotiating licensing agreements? Sure. Um, yes, this is working. Um, the front determination. Um, I have to say from the start that uh, my company has been a long-standing supporter of binding arbitration. Um, we don't want to go to court. We don't like going to court. It's costly. It's, it takes a long time. It's, it's, it's messy. We, we don't want to get there. What we want is to have uh, a proper negotiation um, with our uh, potential business partners. Um, now, coming to the to the to the mechanism proposed by the regulation, um, is that the right one? Um, probably not. And I will say, uh, for example, we have existing uh, structures in Europe and around the world. We have the ICC, we have WIPO, we have the UPC. Um, why not use those venues? Um, do we need another an extra process, which um, through Fundamentally, how it's built, it doesn't actually guarantee an outcome. It doesn't guarantee a license. So we might, as, as it was said, we might actually still end up in court. And then the, the issue of nine months, um, you know, if you look, there were two cases that were cited by, um, by, the, by the proposal um, in, this, um, in one of the recitals, I think recital 40-something, 40 42. And in one case, um, there was a mandatory conciliation uh, proposed for 30 days. <laughs> and in another one, there was uh, the, the condition was one meeting with the conciliator. And then the, 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 the condition for having this sort of conciliation procedure would have been met. And we're dealing here with nine months. I think that's, that's I, and I, I don't know how, how the commission calculated this, if it's an average of what, of what practices around, uh, around Europe. I, I do not know that. Um, for us, again, this procedure is, is, is more a delay in, in, in actual and real negotiations, and it doesn't deliver an outcome which, you know, the desired outcome is, is, is actually a, a, a license. Now, with regards to the, um, the registration, um, I think, you know, even in your question, you said that the, the conditionality that is attached to this registration is, is, is quite problematic. Um, you know, not being able to monetize our patents before, before we register is, 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 is a severe interference with, um, with, with uh, uh, intellectual property rights and with the rights to, 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 to monetize. And, and um, there were a lot of much smarter people than me who said and, and, and proved very eloquently, you know, and, and uh, Max Planck Institute in their paper, they also conclude um, that, that this is a very serious interference. I don't agree to all the, all, all the theories in, in, in that paper, but um, I think this one is, is, um, is, is quite right. Um, in terms of, you know, obligations and, and this, this, this regulation, if we look at it in, from a, a sort of holistic point of view, helicopter view, we have many, many, many obligations for SEP owners. Um, and if you look then at the, the obligations on implementers, there, there are very few of them. And, and we've been talking about asymmetries here. And there is, I'd like to point out another asymmetry in terms of commitments. We do undertake the front commitment. Um, and let's say, you know, this regulation in, in, in a certain form or shape 
passes and, and, and we do have all these obligation and, and obligations and we do the registration, we do the essentiality checks and we pay unknown very variable fees over time to do all these. In the end, we still don't have any guarantee or any commitment that we will have a license. So this is, this is a major problem, that there is, there is no, no guarantee, no commitment um, in, 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 in this regulation. May I? Yeah. Oh, but Fabian, I will uh, yeah. just give voice to Rebecca because I know that she was waiting for uh, a moment. And can you then comment on, the, on that point? Okay. okay. Uh, well, you say that you have nothing uh, uh, as a result for, for the front determination. I don't agree with that because you... I said we don't have a license. You don't have a license, but, have you a license. Have, but you will have something that is almost as good. But you should, because everybody should remember the uh, Huawei CTE framework where you says, well, first you have uh, approach the implementer, and then the implementer has to say he's willing, then the um, uh, uh, SAP holder has to make a friend offer, and then the um, uh, implementer has to make a counter offer, and then everybody thinks, well, that's it. No, there's something left. If the parties do not agree, the implementer has ha has to uh, uh, provide a security deposit. And if he does not provide a security uh, deposit, he will have to face an immediate injunction, no matter what the other steps before uh, have been, has been. Now, this is, for, th this is very important. The problem is, what is the amount for the security deposit? Usually you would say, well, mm, you don't know what the friend rate is, so, uh, but the uh, uh, CGA judgment says it shall be adequate. Uh, well, it must be at least th what the counter offer of the implementer is. But if that's too low, the SCP order doesn't have uh, it doesn't have anything from that. Now, if you have a proposal from the conciliator, an independent expert saying the friend rate should be 1.05, whatever of whatever currency, then I think this is. Uh, 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 what courts should decide that this is the adequate security deposit that the implementer has to provide with interest rates for delay and also uh, and for for all past damages if if the SCP is is registered and that means that from that point actually the SCP holder can lay back and says I don't care how long the litigation will take. I will have the security. I don't have to care whether uh, whether the, the the company will 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 be gone or, or something. I have the security for 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 a com for a full amount of what uh, the independent conciliator uh, found adequate, uh, adequate, and I think that is almost as good as a license. Almost as good as it's not still not a license, and again yeah, we still have to go nothing. to court. <laughs> the point is, it's better than nothing. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so, I mean, a lot has been said. Uh, I also think that the friend uh, conciliation procedure is uh, should be enormously helpful, not only as input to potential court proceedings, but already at the stage of. Um, Negotiations. I think that the friend conciliation procedure, it's called friend determination procedure, it fills a gap left by Huawei ZTE. Because, uh, I, I mean, we can of course enter this argument, but I, I, I don't like this argument on whether, you know, are German courts applying Huawei ZTE in the wrong or right way? This is besides the point. Uh, German courts as many other courts in other countries have been hearing lots and lots of SEP cases. There are super ex experienced judges there. But I think what case law has simply shown is that the core question behind most SEP disputes, namely what are the appropriate licensing terms for a large SEP portfolio, that this question simply often evades adjudication under Huawei ZTE. Huawei ZTE, 
is focused on deciding on injunctions in infringement cases on single patents. So what this regulation does is fill this gap, giving an opportunity to address the real substance of the dispute. And it does so in a non-binding manner. It leaves the autonomy to the, with the parties and the final say with courts. And I really agree with uh, Fabian on saying, regarding this nine month delay, don't wait. And I think in practice, this is not what people would be doing neither from the implementer side nor from the SEP holder side. Why wait until you are actually ready to go to litigation? Use it early on. And uh, if you are prepared to use it early on, and even, <clears throat> look, the friend determination procedure is available after a couple of steps, notification of standards, registration, blah, blah, blah. There is a little bit of delay. But if you were a party, whether that's the SEP holder or the implementer, that was keen to see the quickest path to litigation, the maximum delay that you are facing is 12 months after the standard has been published. I think that very favorably compares with the typical time window that we see between starting negotiations, which may, by the way, be way after the standard has been finalized, and litigation. So um, one thing that I, we didn't have time to uh, really talk about, but that was briefly touched upon, and I, I think, Simona, you said that there, is so, there are all these obligations on uh, patent ho on, 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 on SEP holders. And, you know, to an extent, you are right, because this is a regulation that affects SEP holders arguably most. But I, I would still say it's relatively lightweight. On registration, especially after the, I mean, people always assume that registration is mandatory, is obligatory. And there is, it is true that there is a discrepancy between the intent that the recitals describe which sort of talk about it's fair to require registration. But if you look at the normative language, there is no such obligation. There are consequences of not registering. There are consequences of registering late. And on first sight, you may think, well, geez, these consequences are so severe that, they're, that you're making registration quasi-mandatory. But I, I don't agree with that, especially with the change that Yuri has made. I think it is an entirely viable consideration for SEP holders to consider registering a proud list of patents. So I think the, the actual, if you look at more details than we can do during today's panel, uh, I think the actual burden is not all that high. Thank you, thank you, Rebecca, for that. As we can see, there are different opinions of, on this front determination procedure, whether nine months is a long time or not, and whether the security is a um, solution for, um, for patent holders. I think that, uh, Simona, um, uh, it's important also for the patent holders to have immediate access to this money, and uh, in that case, uh, they, they don't have it. But uh, before moving to a cocktail, I would like to address one more point and ask for your quick comments on the aggregate royalty determination procedure, because I think that it's a last but not least and important part of this regulation. Uh, and Simona, now I will start with you, and I would like to ask you whether do you think uh, Commission is right that this uh, aggregate royalty determination is in fact crucial for transparency. And do you think that it is feasible and practical to determine such a rate uh, in this particular point of time that the Commission uh, is willing it to be determined? Sure, thank you um, for the question. So um, the scope of the regulation covers patents enforced in the EU in one or several member states. So. Um, inherently, uh, uh, a royalty rate, if we don't want to assume that we can settle set prices for patents of other jurisdictions, um, 
a royalty rate set under this um, regulation will cover only EU patents. So in terms of transparency and, and, and certainty, knowing how much a certain standard costs, I don't think we're there. The, 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 the picture the, of the aggregate royalty rate will not be, will not be complete. Um, regarding feasibility, um, I have um, very strong concerns that, that, you know, especially in the time limits given by the Commission, you know, 120 days or 150 days um, uh, with an expert's opinion, I, I, I don't think this is remotely, even remotely feasible. If you think in a, in a one-on-one negotiation, it takes years for two parties to agree on, on, on the rate, and it's two parties. Imagine when you have 50 in a room, <laughs> because everybody will want to be part of this process. Um, I, 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 I don't see how, 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 how that's, that's, that's going to, to, uh, um, to, to, to happen. And then one last point, uh, I'll, be, I'll be brief. You know, w we do have uh, complex standards with um, different implementations. So you, know, you will have to have actually an aggregate, a different aggregate royalty rate for every implementation. And that, again, is, 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 is a huge process, because we would be sitting in, in, in that room forever trying to, find, to, to settle the prices, the, the, the aggregate royalty rate for you know, every single implementation that is, 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 is notified. So again, I, 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 I see the intentions of the Commission, but um, I, I, I have strong doubts regarding the, the feasibility. Thank you. And Rebecca, what is your point on, on this aggregate royalty determination? Do you think that it's uh, key to transparency and in fact it will help in negotiations taking into consideration its current form? Well, the um, draft regulation uh, actually foresees three ways for an aggregate royalty to come about. Huh? And two are time limited and the third one, the expert opinion, is not necessarily time limited. Uh, but neither of these paths is mandatory. And essentially, I mean, this aggregate royalty value has good chances of coming about if there is sufficient interest in having it from the market. If that interest is not there, it will not happen. Uh, would it be useful? Enormously. Huh? It's... Uh, <laughs> And I think it should help SEP holders, Intel is also, is also a SEP holder, by the way, and an implementer, alike, not only in negotiations, but also in business planning. Hmm? So for SEP holders, and remember, the, the aggregate royalty, just like the friend determination, it doesn't dictate, it's not a set thing that then has undoubted validity. It's a non-binding indication. Hmm? But that is good enough. From the perspective of a SEP holder, you get an estimate of the size of the total accessible market that you're operating in. Hmm? Doubtlessly, an important reference point for preparing the pricing of your own offering to that market. For implementers, you get an indication of the overall cost of that you'd have to expect when implementing the standard. Super important as a reference point when you do business planning and you, when you decide whether or not to participate in a market that uses the standard. Hmm? Negotiation lit or even litigation, important reference points against which to check is the, is the, 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 you know, is the value of this friend, the, 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 this friend offer, is it a counter offer? How does it compare? Does it feel right? Does it not feel right? So I think there are multiple perspectives from which the aggregate royalty is super, super interesting. Hmm? And the one thing I would say, I think it is, I'm really, from a business perspective, I'm super, super happy that it is non-binding, that is in, it is just an indication, because that is what this industry need, needs. Business can deal with lack of certainty. We do that all of the time when we do investment decisions. But what we cannot deal with is complete lack of visibility. Fabian, you were taking uh, this last point. Do you think that also this uh, procedure for determination of the aggregate royalty, even non-binding, will be helpful in resolution of the separated disputes? I think so. It will be because uh, if you do not have uh, um, uh, a an expert, especially uh, take the point of the expert opinion uh, on, on the aggregate royalty, if you do not have this, 
how can you do a top-down approach? I mean, if, if a court would have to do it uh, themselves, it would be extremely a lot of work and, and uh, it would uh, 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 take a lot of time for, for the litigation. And, um, but, so, and, and I think that's what ha happens until now. You don't use the top-down approach. But this means you're left only with comparable licenses. And if you take a look at the judgments dealing with comparable licenses, in my view, uh, uh, you have so many different comparable licenses with frame rates that are so widely spread that, that it's really difficult to, to, to base a judgment only on that. And that's why I say you, you all need the second path of the top-down approach and therefore you need uh, uh, the, uh, the aggregate royalty. Um, and that's why I think it's, 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 it's a good uh, um, uh, thing to, to have this mechanism in, in this uh, regulation. Thank you. Thank you for that discussion. Uh, to wrap up, I think that uh, it was extremely helpful and useful to hear your different uh, often views on, on that topic. I think that uh, we all see the need of regulation, but uh, we also see the scope of imp for improvement. And we'll see what will happen next week in the European Parliament. Thank you. <laughs>panelists and to, to all of you uh, for, for staying a little bit later than envisaged but I think both Alexandra and I took the view that you know we shouldn't really cut this panel short there was a lot to go through um, in a relatively short period of time and please stay for drinks to, to continue this discussion or other discussion perhaps so there was some time to, to kind of draw conclusions and I want to give some time to Benno for sure so from my perspective, I don't really have much to add to, to the views that have been uh, contributed. I, th I think purely personally, I think that it's a bit difficult, I mean, echoing what Christopher uh, said um, at the end of the first panel, it's a bit difficult to say that the current situation is ideal, uh, whether we characterize that as a market failure from a kind of textbook perspective or not, and what's a market failure and so on and so forth, and whether regulation needs b a proven market failure, we leave it to the theoretical economists to, to, to discuss, but I think there is, I think, a, a general view um, that you know, the, the current situation is not ideal with these protract protracted dances um, uh, with parties that would like to agree, that would like a license, as, as, as Simona was saying, but it takes years currently under the Huawei procedure to, to, to get to the stage where you can go to a court for a determination that sometimes never happens. It does in England. I wanted to reemphasize that point. Um, uh, efficiency of the English courts, which are, however, now outside the European Union. So it doesn't really matter in terms of <laughs> the impact assessment and all the, all the rest of it. Um, uh, uh, but uh, the, the, the thing, you know, I mean, you know, the nine months, I mean, the cooling off period, etc. I mean, if you read the reported cases, uh, whether it's German case and English cases, etc. You know, go, going through the one-way dance it takes years before we can, you can get to court, let alone nine months. I, I do agree that's a fairly proportionate cooling off period. Um, it, and, and, and I do think, actually, that the front commitment does make a difference here. Um, when we talk about the protection of uh, the IP right and, and fundamental right and, uh, rights and so on and so forth. Because of course, generally, an IP right and a patent uh, gives the right to exclude every, everybody else, right? I, I can do, well, with some exceptions anyway, because it's not uh, ideal, ideal from a social perspective for people ha to have perhaps valuable inventions and do nothing with them. But in theory, w w with exceptions, that's possible. And as a patent holder, I can generally say, I don't want to license it to anybody else. I just exploit it and that's it. Or, or I just keep it there. Or I use it for following, you know, for following innovation, whether I get a more valuable patent at some point. But of course, that's where the front commitment does make a difference because uh, the, the patent holder has agreed to license. 
and, and therefore this right of exclusion of everybody else doesn't apply any longer, and I have to license to a, anybody. Uh, generally, those commitments say anybody. We don't go there and say you know, supply chain, etc. But we say anybody who who wants that license. A and the question is only the terms and how much. So you know, any cooling off period only gives you the risk, perhaps, of the insolvency of the prospective licensee. But in these circumstances, the regulation still gives you the, the possibility to go to court and ask for a bond to be posted as, as a kind of interim, uh, uh, urgent interim measure, if there is that kind of risk. But it's really the only risk. At the end of the day, you will have to license, uh, and the licensee, if the patent is valid and infringed and essential, will have to pay a royalty. It, it, it's only how much. And yes, of course, it would be nice to have a kind of binding resolution in nine months, etc. but... Um, you know, and um, that's not what the Commission proposes, and I think it's nobody else is really pu pushing for it. There is a theoretical argument whether it's, it's possible or not. Of course, in the UK, in the entire construction industry, there is a binding, uh, not final, but binding uh, ADR procedure for resolution of construction disputes. It's not a breach of fundamental rights, it's called adjudication. Um, but the Commission proposes less than that, the, 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 the draft regulation proposes less than that, much less than that, a non-binding opinion, um, which, you know, as I said at the beginning, parties are just free to ignore, but parties, of course, if they do want that binding license, can, can agree to it. If the, nothing prevents the parties to, to take the commercial view, um, that that's actually a fair uh, uh, determination and they just agree to that and that's the end of the matter so that, that's that but I think it's right not to make that uh, determination binding and leave it to party autonomy to decide whether it's it's just right and to accept it or perhaps it's the basis for a negotiation that, that, that can be perhaps much shorter I, I, I do think actually what will be crucial is really the value uh, and the expertise of those who will do the front determination, because these this front determinations being non-binding opinions will only be just as good a a as they are, as good as they are close to a true friend uh, that both parties can accept. So I think there is a huge uh, pressure that will be for the success of this instrument if it's approved in the end. Uh, to those who will will make these determinations, but this, mm, as, as I said at the beginning, and it's, it's all it's all non non binding, um, and it's all facilitative ADR, and of course it does impose burdens. Any regulation imposes burdens, and uh, those on whom burdens are imposed uh, cannot possibly like them. But I mean, the question is, given the current situation, the huge value of these. Uh, disputes and negotiations to the EU, to the EU um, economy, are these burdens reasonable and proportionate to registration and a set of non-binding facilitative ADR, or is it something too draconian and too disproportionate? I personally would say it f seems fairly reasonable and, and proportionate to me given where we are coming from. But uh, of course Parliament will have um, further opportunities to, to debate and decide of that, and of course the details of the regulation in the legislative procedure can be further, can be improved and hammered out and, and, and some of the language tighten up, etc., which in, in my view would be welcome. But as obviously, I, oh, I, I never want to say anything and then I always ended up talking too much. Ben, no, I think over to you with, again, many thanks for co-hosting and co-organizing this. So I'd, for you, for the, your concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Renato. And uh, like, I realize that you know, I'm the only obstacle here that is between uh, you know, this, this very constructive discussion and uh, the drinks. So I will keep it very short. I should say also that you know, I, there is a certain degree of collusion going on between uh, Renato and myself because, of course, Renato is, is doing you know, the the substance here in the, in the conclusion. So I will only wrap up, say that I greatly enjoyed this, um, this discussion. I found it was a very constructive one, a very you know, facts-based one, which is exactly what we wanted. We wanted to get all the sides on the table. We wanted to hear all the arguments from both sides to have you know, constructive debate. And I'm glad, actually, I was at, very, at you know, a number of conferences also in the past months 
that have been quite controversial. So I have to say, I, I want to thank again all the speakers and also the audience for you know maintaining that constructive debate and for you know trying the arguments if you want that are there and you know helping us to understand what the regulation is about and in what sense. And now I'm picking up you know a word that that, that I pretty much liked actually. In what sense it fills a gap in in what we have right now. I think that you know I realize that that you know there's of course certain differences in the positions but in the end to me this seemed to be you know some some common position there's you know there's a gap here and it it, it needs to be filled and the the regulation is an attempt in in, in doing that um so let me thank again like the the speakers and also most importantly the audience of today's event i'm very glad that we managed to organize this event which is a cooperation between king's college and charles river associate and having said that you know, I hope that many of you join me now for the cocktail. It's waiting outside. We have some bubbles, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to continuing our discussion uh, during the cocktail. Thank you very much. Thank you.